AFR On Demand is brought to you by Breck Golf. Try Beaver Creek today, just 20 minutes from downtown Baton Rouge in the Zachary area. They've got a PGA Tour driving range, a short game practice area, 30 to 40 yard practice shots. It's a great place to chip and putt and practice if you don't have time for a full round. Book your tee time today, golf.breck.org, golf.breck.org. Matt Moscona. I'm very important. After further review. Say one more time. After further review with Matt Moscona. And here we go. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studios. Let's Hour three, off we go. Welcome aboard. Glad you're with us. AFR presented by Relief Windows. I'm Matt. You're a loser, Matt! Hey, shut up, kid. Paul O'Neill. They're chanting Paul O'Neill's name. Mm, You suck. And Mr. Toby Tomplay. All right, we're here. Glad you are as well. Five o'clock quitting time. Glad you are driving home with us. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, NFL meetings going on. Some of what Brian Kelly had to say after practice on Saturday. We'll get to more of your reaction from the weekend. David DeLucci, good enough to join us now as he does every Monday to recap the weekend in the SEC. Luch, how are you, man? Uh, I'm doing great. Just waiting for this weather to, to set in tonight. We're batting down the hatches over here. I know, man. Uh, a proverbial storm around LSU baseball as well. Um, where is the the panic meter for LSU after losing the first two series? Well, I, I think the the average LSU fan is, is starting to raise the panic meter up quite a bit because they basically saw Florida come in and, and do to LSU what LSU typically does to all the other teams in the Southeastern Conference. And and look, man, I, I'm going to go back to the Mississippi State series. Mississippi State is turning out to be a better ball club than I think everyone thought. Um, so you tip your cap to what they did. And then Florida came in and showed that from top to bottom, the lineup is one of the most potent and powerful lineups in the country. Uh, when you have a Game 3 starter, like Jack Caglione that can come in and pitch the way he did. Not only did he command a fastball in the upper 90s, but he also located his changeup. That was the most effective pitch that he had. Um, It's tough, man. But both of those teams played really good baseball. And and I got to tell you, like I'm sitting here watching the Florida hitters get into the batter's box, and the first thing I thought of is, and it seems to me like they had more confidence at the plate than the LSU hitters. Uh, who were actually playing at home in front of a, a really nice crowd all weekend long. It just didn't seem like the offense was very comfortable or confident. That was certainly the case on Sunday, Luch. I mean, I, the the big positive for LSU had to be the starting pitching actually did well. I mean, Luke Holman struck out 13, Gage Jump was really good into the sixth, and uh, you got four shutout innings from Thatcher Hurd to start the game. But you're right, the offense didn't come along. So if you're if you're Jay Johnson, like, what do you do to try to jumpstart the offense? Man, I, I think probably what he's going to end up doing is shuffling the lineup around a little bit. It, it just seems to me we're in an era where analytic, analytics is kind of controlling the offensive approaches. And, and the difference between non-conference and conference is the players in the SEC are so talented, they can adapt and they can adjust. And so there are a lot of swings. I saw Florida struck out way more than LSU did. Florida just connected, and, and their, their power display was really what separated the two. But a lot of the swings that LSU offensive players had, they, they just weren't – their timing was not there. It was almost like they were in between, like they were looking for a pitch that they didn't get, but they knew they had to swing at it because this pitch was over the plate or it was a strike. So um, I, I just – I think you got to go back to the basics. I think you got to see ball and hit ball, shuffle the lineup a little bit. Your home run guys are hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Jared Jones, Tommy White, Hayden Trebinsky. Um, The other thing I, I, I would like to do is, is clean up the defense a little bit. I saw some missed balls by the catchers. There are two very good catchers behind the plate that 
proved to be extremely costly, especially in game two. Dave Delucci is with us. Um, if there's a silver lining, it's it's kind of that the whole league is a bit of a hodgepodge right now. Um, Vandy got swept at South Carolina. Luch, how did that happen? I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm looking at numbers here, and I, I can't figure it out. I mean, it just goes to show you what the SEC is all about. Vanderbilt in the series against Auburn. Auburn is a very good team. And Auburn is one in five right now, which is crazy. But Vandy had 46 hits against Auburn. They only had 18 hits total um, against a, a team that is good, but Ole Miss beat South Carolina two out of th- three and made South Carolina look average. And here they are. Now everybody's talking about how South Carolina is very good and Vanderbilt has some holes. Vanderbilt doesn't hit the long ball, so they're going to have to beat you by long rallies. They couldn't do that. They struck out a ton over the weekend. They played terrible defense. Um, Kentucky is your your top team in in the SEC East. Who would ever thought that? Mm-hmm. So it's crazy. It's jumbled. Uh, what I would say is, I look at the Southeastern Conference schedule like it's ten round boxing match, and LSU has two more rounds to go. Look, in twenty twenty two, Ole Miss started at two and four, which is where LSU is now. Then they were five and ten, seven and fourteen. They end up winning the national championship. And last year, Tennessee was in Omaha. They started five and ten as well. So it's not how you start; it's how you finish. And what can you figure out along the way? And I have confidence in Jay Johnson, his staff, and his players that they'll get back on track. Yeah, the the Tennessee comp of a year ago is probably the best one, Luch, because when you look ahead for LSU, you see okay. You're at Arkansas, you're home against Vandy, you're at Tennessee. There's a very real possibility you hit the halfway point of the league at at five and ten or six and nine in the conference. So it does go to show you 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 can overcome that. Um which result so far in the SEC, good or bad, is surprising you the most when you look at the standings through two weeks? Uh mentioned Kentucky surprising me, especially in the East, but I, I I really believe Auburn is a much better ball club uh, than their record shows. I mean, they ran into uh, Arkansas, and LSU was going to see uh, get a taste of Arkansas and how good that pitching staff is next weekend. Um, Auburn is, is a very good team. They will not be in last place when it's all said and done and the dust settles. Um, I think they're going to move their way up, but it, it's crazy, man. So far in two weekends – only three visiting teams won series, and, and unfortunately for Tiger fans, they got to see one of them in the Florida Gators. But it's extremely difficult to win on the road. And just from top to bottom, maybe minus Missouri, who can kick it in gear uh, on any given day, from top to bottom, every single one of these SEC teams can win a game and win a series. Hey, Luge, um before you go, when you look ahead to this weekend, I mean LSU at Arkansas is going to be a it's going to be a giant challenge. But um, do you see what what do you see as a path for LSU this weekend on the road against that that Arkansas pitching staff? Which I mean, the staff ERA is like two two right now. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's stupid. And um, Hagen Smith, the 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 lefty that's going to start Game One. Uh, reminds me a lot of Paul Skeens, just the way he gets on the mound with confidence and tempo, and he, he's just he he just has the look and the feel of a guy that's going to be in the big leagues in a couple years. You're going to have to make him throw the ball over the heart of the plate. He's not going to waste a lot of pitches. I, I think in the 12 strikeout game he had the other night, he only gave up three hits and maybe two walks. Um, he and Luke Holman. Uh, are going to be a tremendous matchup. I hope all eyes in the country are watching it. But uh, if you're the Tigers, you're going to have to commit. You're going to have to look fastball because you're going to see a lot of fastballs all weekend long um, and and hit off that fastball and be on time. I would not be sitting in between pitches. Uh, and swing with conviction, man. If you're going to go down, you're going to go down swinging. You're going to go down with bad intentions. Uh, I think the Tigers are going to, they're going to have their work cut out for them, but they've got a few days. They've got a big mid- midweek game that hopefully they can get their confidence back with. David DeLucci, good enough to join us every Monday here after the weekend that was in the Southeastern Conference. Lucci, we always appreciate it, man. Happy Easter to you and your family. We'll look, talk, look forward to talking next week, man. 
Sounds great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Luge. It's after further review. Um, if you're kind of looking offensively at what LSU may do, Jay Johnson kind of told you after the Florida series, and one of the things he talked about was was Ethan Fry, and that's a guy very clearly he wants to get more involved. We're trying to get him back at full capacity. I want to play him. Like, he was on the verge of playing a lot until he slid and, you know, whatever, subluxed his, his shoulder. I told you guys, you know, for a better part of a long time, I really believe in him. We have a good team. So, I mean, just the attitude piece, the work piece, and the talent is pretty good. And so I want to get him out there, and I'm excited to continue to get him out there. What do you like? Look, if, if Jared Jones ends up going pro after this year, which I think he will, he's going to bash 20 homers, and there's going to be a big league team that drafts him and pays him. Um, next year, Ethan Fry is probably your your everyday first baseman, and he's going to be that big dude that, you know, I think he's more athletic than Jones and, and can probably play in the outfield, but that's that's very likely his role next year because you have a ton of outfielders on this team, a ton of really talented guys that are sitting and watching. So, and then you're going to have Portal, but that that's going to be Fry's role on this team next year. Like, go stand on first base, club the baseball, and and then go pro. But how do you get him into the lineup this year? And and that's going to be the challenge. Again, if you DH him, then you're catching Hayden Travinsky, which means the only way you get Brady Neal in the lineup is in right field. Well, now you are that's – that's a detriment in right field. Well, then what do you do with Josh Pearson? You have to play him at second base. That means Milam comes off the field. Well, Milam has been a, like a little bit of a spark plug for you. I know the last two weeks in conference play have been great for him offensively. Um but he's a hard worker, and he's the kind of like you know, head foes, you know, nose in it, dude. That you want, like the kind of I know it's cliche, but the dirt bag that you want in your lineup every day. So, it's it's a it's a challenge for for Jay Johnson to figure out like how you jumpstart this offense without completely compromising yourself defensively. So, it, it's not an easy puzzle to put together, but that's. That's what Jay Johnson is, is tasked with right now, figuring out that best combination. Okay, uh, it's after further review. We're glad you're here with us. Monday Shows is always brought to you by Relief Windows and ReliefWindows.com. Windows door siding. Oh, yeah. They do indoor shutters as well. Relief Windows and ReliefWindows.com. When we come back, uh, so after practice on Saturday, Brian Kelly met with reporters, and I do want to circle back to one thing he said in particular, which... Caught my, of all the things Brian Kelly said, which caught my attention the most, and it's a it's it's a battle for a number two position. It's not on the defensive side, but I do want to delve into that, and we'll get to it next on AFR. AFR. You know, I love telling you about Darren James and Associates, brokered by LPT Realty. Darren actually sent me this over the weekend. He said, Matt, please use my live reads this week to promote this message. It's a colleague of Darren's whose daughter... Uh, Gracie has cerebral palsy in her left foot and they've discovered a procedure that can help her walk again. Uh, only part of it, though, is covered by insurance. So they do have a, a large medical bill associated with it. And so um, if you can, they created a, a GoFundMe for, uh, for Gracie. It's uh, Rob and Melissa Filler, their daughter, Gracie. And uh, Rob also has a restoration carpet and tile cleaning business. So proceeds from that business also are going to go to uh, Gracie's medical fund. So again, it's Gracie Filler if you want to go find on GoFundMe. Uh, Gracie Filler, F-I-L-L-E-R, if you can and you're willing to give to that family, Darren asked that we promote that this week. Think real estate, think Darren James. After further review, presented by Relief Windows, Windows Door Siding. Oh yeah, they also do interior shutters. LSU football was uh, on the practice field Saturday, full media availability, and then afterwards, Brian Kelly met with reporters, and he talked about a lot, and as you might imagine, so many of the questions are about what's happening in the secondary, and some obvious things were, look, they were bad defensively. They replaced the whole defensive staff. You got a couple of transfers in the secondary. Jordan Gilbert at safety. Uh, obviously, Jair Brown coming in at cornerback from Ohio State. 
the, de- the numbers at defensive tackle where you literally have an offensive lineman, Kimo Makaneoli, who's moved over to defensive tackle just to give you numbers there here in the spring. Sean Washington, the Juco transfer who's coming. Like Harold Perkins on the inside, Blake Baker. Like all The defense is where all the questions are. And that's where everyone's trying to find answers. Well, Brian Kelly was talking uh, to reporters on Saturday and he kind of, I'm always interested when coaches say things that are unprompted. And maybe this is just, my experience of sitting through endless amount of press conference audio for two decades now, and so much of it is coach speak and just worthless sound. But you start to look for, okay, where is the thing that's interesting? And sometimes coaches, when they say something that's unprompted, you ask them about one thing, but then they mention something else, that a lot of times tells me, ah, like that's a light bulb moment. Well, that happened on Saturday when Brian Kelly was talking. Like he was asked about um, first it was offensive line and then and then it was receivers. Like he mentioned um, basically the fact that Will Campbell and Emory Jones are getting a lot of time off in the spring. And why not? Like I, I reference this often, but years ago I, I, I reference this because this isn't unique to this person. It was just a hilarious story. Moel D. Moore was a running back at Tulane who a lot of you might remember. He played at Bel Air and Baton Rouge, went to uh, went to Tulane, and when he finished Tulane, he was like one of two players in the history of college football that had like 4,000 rushing yards and 2,000 receiving yards and a bajillion this or that. He was just an incredible player. And he he told him, I remember he was playing for the Steelers and they were going to play in the Super Bowl and I was interviewing him. We were talking about spring football and he just laughed and he's like, coach told me like just go sit on the bleachers. Like he never took a rep in spring ever because it's like, why would you? You know what he is. Don't even run the risk of putting him out there. Spring is just for guys who are going to be first-time starters or, or young guys that need reps. And so, like, I don't need Will Campbell or Emory Jones taking a single rep in spring. You know what I need? Those guys to be healthy and in shape when LSU plays USC in Vegas. That's all I need from those two guys. So, um, Bordelon and Tyree Adams have been taking reps at offensive tackle. Great. I told you last year in, in fall camp, Bordelon was one of my most improved guys. He was taking reps at left tackle and was winning. Like it was very clear that was a guy who came in, had the frame, was a project, and was improving, which is really encouraging. So I love getting Bordelon and Tyree Adams reps. So Brian Kelly was asked about those two guys. Well, listen to the answer. There's a couple of positions I think we need key backups. And and the other one that we're, as you know, that we're we're working on is the key backup at quarterback and and that position needs to continue to grow as well so um I, I, my eyes are on those areas at the tackle position and certainly at the quarterback position nobody asked him about backup quarterback the question was about adams and bordelon getting reps at offensive tackle and brian kelly offered the comment about backup quarterback now, here's the reason that's interesting. And I'm, I'm sure you'll agree as we talk through this. They bring in A.J. Swan from Vanderbilt. Now, A.J. Swan, it's not like he had this decorated career, but A.J. Swan has played two years at Vanderbilt. And he's played a lot of football at Vanderbilt as well. In he's gotten in his career, he... He threw a, he had 198 attempts in 2022 as a freshman, 196 attempts in 2023 as a sophomore. So this is a guy who has played more a lot more football than even your starter, Garrett Nussmeyer. So it would stand to reason. Look, Swan and Ricky Collins aren't pushing Nussmeyer. It's Nussmeyer's team. He's the starter. That's not even debatable. It's never even going to be called into question. But the legitimate question is, okay, what if Nussmeyer turns an ankle? What if Nussmeyer has the flu? What if Nussmeyer takes a shot under the chin like Jaden Daniels did from Dallas Turner and you need somebody to play the second half against Alabama? Well, who goes into the game? Swan is the guy with the experience. And the fact that LSU went and got him, to me, signaled, okay, they were looking not for a guy to compete with Nussmeyer, but for a guy to give them experience depth in the event something that I just mentioned happened. But Brian Kelly's telling you right there, and again, he wasn't asked about it. He offered it. Like, we're looking at these two guys. 
So as to say, A.J. Swan and Ricky Collins are competing for the number two job. And that does matter because it is rare that you find a season where you go through and your starter takes every rep at quarterback, be it performance or injury or any of the things that, that we just said. So I do find that interesting because if you'll remember, we turn back the clock. When LSU brought Jaden Daniels in, I was one of the few people, and this isn't a back pad, it's just for context. I was one of the few people who, when everybody was Miles Brennan, Miles Brennan, Miles Brennan, who said, y'all, they didn't go get a three-year starter from Arizona State to come here and watch. There's a reason they went and got that guy. Because they weren't confident with the guys they had. And it, and it manifests that way. It was very clear and obvious. Well, you could look at it the same way. The They had Ricky Collins. They had Colin Hurley coming in. They go get A.J. Swan. You could look at it and say the reason they went and got A.J. Swan is because they wanted someone who was an experienced backup behind Nussmeyer, who, by the way, is a standard prototypical uh, NFL straight drop back quarterback, whereas Ricky Collins, who we saw at Woodlawn in Baton Rouge, is a dual threat guy. Look, I watched Ricky Collins play Catholic, and Ricky Collins didn't have a whole bunch of college guys on his team. It wasn't a whole bunch of D1 signees. And they played a Catholic team that was great, and Ricky Collins damn near single handedly beat that team. And Catholic ain't used, used to losing to Woodlawn. They lost to Ricky Collins that day at Memorial. Anyway, so they're stylistically very different. So you go get A.J. Swan, it's like, oh, I see. You want the standard prototypical drop-back pocket passer who's more like Nussmeyer because Nuss isn't going to run. Nuss, Nuss had one rushing attempt last year. One. He had like one, one, or he had one rushing yard last year. It's not a part of your offense. It's not a part of A.J. Swan's game either. As a freshman, he had negative 76 rushing yards. As a sophomore, he had 16. Nuss and Swan are similar, so the transition seemingly would be easier from one to the next if it happened that way. Well, Brian Kelly's telling you, no, no, no. I, we need to find out who's going to win that backup job, which tells me more than anything, Ricky Collins' arrow is pointing up because if it were just A.J. Swan's going to be the backup, and that's why you brought him here, then Ricky Collins would probably be looking for the escape hatch. Because, as we know, Garrett Nussmeyer is the outlier. Quarterbacks don't stay. They leave. If they don't play, they leave. And if you're Collins and you know Nuss is there ahead of you, they just brought in Swan, who in theory would be ahead of you as well because of experience, and now you've got the quarterback coming behind you in, uh, in Colin Hurley, and then five-star Bryce Underwood comes next year, you're Ricky Collins going, I'm the odd man out. Well, not if he beats out A.J. Swan, which apparently is very much a thing that is in play. So I don't know how that's going to play out. A.J. Swan may end up winning that backup job. As I mentioned, A.J. Swan's a guy that played for two years at Vanderbilt. He started 20 career games in the SEC. That's, that's something that not even Garrett Nussmeyer has, and certainly Ricky Collins doesn't have. So if you can find a guy that stylistically more mirrors the guy you have, who's played a bunch, it makes sense that he would be the backup. But Brian Kelly's offering to you, that ain't the case. That makes me very optimistic about the progress Ricky Collins has made here year one to year two and hopefully will we'll continue to make. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I mean, when A.J. Swan came out of high school, he was a three-star, the number 28 quarterback in the country. Ricky Collins was a four-star, the number 15 quarterback in the country. So it's almost like you'd be deciding, are you going with experience or the higher ceiling. And Swan has the experience, but Collins has the higher ceiling. How quickly can Ricky Collins you know, e emerge and grow toward that ceiling? It's probably going to determine who ends up being LSU's backup quarterback this year, which I think is going to be fascinating to watch, not only in spring, but certainly as we get to fall camp. Okay, uh, it's after further review. Brought to you by Evermore. Got my bottle of Evermore right here. I went into a Circle K today. Y'all had a meeting over at with Tilly and Terry over at Hudco, uh, was driving on back, pulled into a into a gas station, pulled into a Circle K, walked right over to the water, boom, Evermore. Great tasting Evermore. It's all natural artesian water. I cannot recommend enough that you try a bottle of Evermore. If you go into a gas station or a grocery store, like you buy the the, the uh, 12 pack of, of 20 ounce bottles, 
You can buy the 32 ounce bottle, the 64 ounce bottle at all the great local retailers. If it's if it's Rouse's or Mathurns or Albertsons or Target, I mean, there's ton. There, you can find it anywhere. Gas stations. Pass on the crinkly bottle, the, the cheaply made crinkly bottle of water, and grab Evermore. It's all natural, great tasting water that never touches air until you uncap it. And it's it's a Louisiana product. It's a national brand that is a Louisiana product. Try it today. The next time you go, you want a better form of hydration, a healthier lifestyle for you, for your family, for your children. You know, if you're an athlete that wants that better hydration, reach for Evermore. E-V-A-M-O-R. Evermore.com. You can buy it online or go to great local retailers. Evermore.com. I needed a sip anyway because I needed to clear my throat. Okay. Um, been a good show so far. We're glad you're with us. I'll get to some of your uh, reaction um, uh, to a lot of what we've talked about today. Otter locks in about 15 minutes from right now. Looking forward to having Jimmy on the show. The guys are back from uh, from the bow where they were for three days for the NCAA tournament. So Otter locks in about 15 minutes from right now. Stick around. It's AFR. AFR. Oh, y'all, spring has sprung now. My goodness. It is officially... Spring, Easter, this weekend, it is time to get out in the yard. Maybe you're going to have people coming over for Easter. Just plant something. It is full-on just plant something time. Maybe you want a vegetable garden. Just plant something. At Clegg's, their greenhouses are bursting with blooms. Begonias, geraniums, supertinas. Y'all check them out at Clegg's. Every single day, they've got more truckloads arriving. They're actually expanding their greenhouse at the Segan Lane location as well. They've got tricolor hibiscus. They've got blueberries, which, of course, are a great local favorite. Check them out at Clegg's Nursery. Johnny Naylor Seeds. If you need weed and feed, it's time. If your lawn is starting to grow and you're seeing the weeds pop up, they've got weed and feed for your lawn. You want to have the most beautiful, plush, green lawn in your entire neighborhood? Clegg's has the products to help. So get by any of the four locations. Buy local, shop local at Clegg's Nursery. After further review, presented by Relief Windows, Windows Door Siding. Oh, yeah, they also do interior shutters. Oh, we get to Locks uh, about 10 minutes from right now. Um, one of the big stories in the weekend, of course, was the uh, was Kim Mulkey's statement. Uh, she made her, her sort of uh, preemptive strike against the Washington Post for a story they're apparently working on. Uh, the reporter is a guy named Kent Babb, and a couple of years ago, he wrote a piece about Brian Kelly being a $100 million coach in Baton Rouge when... Um, if, if I'm to, to summarize, uh, hey, Baton Rouge, your city is a dump and you're paying a coach $100 million, your priorities are out of whack. That's That was the gist of it. So Kim Mulkey has refused to talk to this guy for two years and he's been trying to drum up a story against her, talking to former players and former coaches of hers uh, to try to get them to say negative things. And so she sort of fired a proactive strike on Saturday, a preemptive strike on Saturday to say, you publish stuff that's untrue, I'm coming after you. Um, anyway, I, I think there's a lot of what he what what she what she is alleging that he did uh lacks journalistic integrity. If if he is in in fact, if he did in fact reach out to former coaches of, that coached with her uh, under the 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 false pretense that he was in Baton Rouge working on a story with her to get them to speak, and, and that was a factual inaccuracy, then then, then that is sleazy. That's there's no other way around that. Um, anyway, so I, I gave my my take on on the Mulkey thing, and why really the the question is that so many people ask is why do why do people seemingly have it out for Kim Mulkey? And and I in no uncertain terms kind of laid that out in hour number one. I'll I'll direct you back to the podcast if you want to check it on demand. We'll put the video up as well. I mean, I, I gave about a ten minute answer to it, but. Um, the gist is in that world of women's college basketball, she is an outlier for, for a lot of very obvious reasons. Um, I got a tweet from a guy, uh, Nathan Efferson, uh, for someone who claims to be politically agnostic, congratulations on proving that false in 30 seconds of your Kim Mulkey take. Uh, I know you want clicks and to be quote Baton Rouge famous for free j drinks at Chili's, uh, but come on. Um, <laughs> I always laugh 
So first of all, Chili's two for one is fire. I'm not going to lie. Like, you go in there, you get two for one and the queso. That's pretty fire, dude. Why the straight Chili's? Like, really, I man? Know. Dang. I, I mean. I'm with you. I like Chili's. Yeah. Too, um, and if we're being completely honest, I don't need free drinks at Chili's. I do I do quite okay. Uh, I mean, whatever. Um, but I always laugh when people try to paint me as a homer. And I've ne- I don't know that I've ever said this on air, but I'll say it now. Uh, like, the former athletic director literally banned anyone in the athletic department from coming on my show for a time at LSU. I never said it on air, certainly not while it was happening. I, I didn't need to drive a wedge or create more angst or anything like that. But it was all related to my, my takes on Ed Ogeron during that, that whole time. And he was a guy that that was a P1 listener of the station, listened to everything we said all the time, and did not like me as a result of that. And so tried in earnest to make my job very difficult for me. Um, and, and I don't care. I didn't care then, nor do I care now. I was still going to do my job the way I do it. Because when you sit in this chair, this is something in, like, for anybody... It, Maybe this resonates with you. Maybe, maybe you're someone who aspires to, to be a, a host, a podcast, a media creator. Maybe your kid does or something. When you do this job, you, you cannot care what people think. The only way to do it well, there's only one way, one truth in this job, which is you're, you're honest to yourself. You, you cannot fabricate opinions because ultimately people will find you to be a fraud. That's, that's just the fact. Because if you keep... If you fabricate opinions for attention, eventually you're going to contradict yourself and and people aren't dumb. So the thing I say all the time when anyone asks is what I say here, I, I truly believe. And and it and if if there comes a day when the whole collective of you who are kind enough to spend part of your day listening or watching, wherever you may be. You all collectively may come to the point one day where you say, you know what, Scone stinks. We're sick of him. He's been on air long enough. Never listen to that guy again. Okay, I'll leave. I mean, it's it's really that simple. There is nothing I can do, literally nothing, to make you listen to or watch this show. Nothing. It's like any form of art. You, an artist cannot make people love their music. An actor cannot make people love their movies. A, a, a painter cannot make people love their, their art. It's, I'm not calling myself an artist, but I think you understand my point. I just do a show. You either like it or you don't. Over the course of the last 14 years, we've had a great amount of success. If it's ratings or revenue or awards or, or digital impression or any any metric, any measure of success, we've had a lot of it. And I'm I'm super humbled by that and always fortunate. But it's because I just sit here and I tell you my truth, whatever that may be, whether you like it or don't. And I'm never going to fabricate an opinion to make you like me. So to the guy that says I'm trying to be Baton Rouge famous, brother, I don't – the only thing I care about in life when I wake up in the morning is to create a great life for my wife and my son and to to, to try to be a good human. Like, th- that's it. If the day comes and nobody listens to the show anymore, I'll figure it out, man. Like, I'm good. I'll go figure something out. I'll load bananas on a truck. I don't know. I'll do something. But it's just... The funny part about that take, though... Is and, and this is what I was getting at. If you if you have the time or the tolerance to go back and listen to the whole segment that I did earlier, was with respect to Kim Mulkey, she's an outlier because she is a out unapologetically outspoken heterosexual white woman, Southern Christian conservative, all that stuff in an uh, in an an ecosystem that makes her an outlier, right? Um, and the point I was making was I don't care. I don't care if you're left, right, red, blue, R, D, conservative, liberal. I, I don't care. I'm like one iota. I, there's not an ounce of me that cares. All like I believe that if you live on either one of those fringes, you're both nuts. Like 
instead of instead of arguing over our differences, why don't we try to focus more on our commonalities to find common ground and the reasons that we can all get along and make the world better? Like that's that's just my approach to life. Um, I thought I wanted to do news and policy. I don't know why I'm going down the stretch. I, 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 this all just popped into my mind as that guy tweeted that I was reading that. Like I wanted to do news. Like I thought I was going to be a newsman, and this is when like the evening news was still a thing. Um, like I was going to be Peter Jennings or Tom Brokaw or someone like that. You, Dan Rather. Um, and I went down that path for four or five years, and I hated it. I just hated the culture around it. That's why I do sports now. So that's why I pivoted in my career back in 2007. Um, so, yeah. Man, like, but what I find is, so like this guy who tweeted at me, it's always interesting when you, either side, by the way, whether you are far left or far right, you're both kooks. And you're both wrong because when you're that far to the fringe, if someone is trying to look at something somewhere close to the middle, and I'm not telling you I'm, I'm perfectly sh straddling that line, but if you are so far to one side, if someone's in the middle or close to it, to you they appear to be an extremist because you're so far to the outside and you don't realize your view is the one that's flawed. So whatever. Um, I hate politics. I hate talking about politics and social events and all that stuff. Like my, I've always believed with this show, and this is a good time to talk about it because of all the stuff popping up. I've always believed with this show that you come here for sports. That's why you're here. It's not to say other things don't matter, but I'm not going to do the bait and switch. Like You come here with the expectation of hearing about sports, so that's what I'm going to do. It's not to say other things aren't important, but there are places where you can go to get those things. It's like if I buy a ticket to a concert and I have to listen to the artist pontificate about their political views or social views, I, and I don't care what side they're on because there's plenty that do both. Um, that pisses me off. I, I, that's not why I came. I came to, to listen to you play music. So I think the same thing. Like when I do this show, you come here to hear me talk about sports. That's why we never talked about Kaepernick when that was going on. And I don't have been, that's why I tried not to go deep into like the COVID argument, except for as it pertained to how it affected sports, which was a it was clumsy, admittedly, a lot of times. I mean, just it was a weird time. Um, but so too with this with this Mulkey stuff. Uh wh wherever it may go. Um I'm more interested in how. LSU is going to fare in the Sweet 16 against UCLA or Creighton, whoever wins tonight. And if they win, are they going to play Caitlin Clark in Iowa and get a rematch of last year's championship game and how the matchup has changed? You don't have Jasmine Carson out there going like, you know, 100% from three like you did in the championship. You're like, that's the more interesting thing for me than all this. But sometimes these things become the storyline, and that was the storyline this weekend, so I had to talk about it. Anyway, I just want to take some time to – I don't know why I felt compelled to take time to talk about that, but I did. So uh, I hope you, you'll you you'll indulge me. Um, all right, it's after further review. We're brought to you by Michelle Weighing and Measurement. Love my friends over at Michelle. They're great, man. Uh, Joel McMullen, the whole staff over there. You know, I got to go when they did the ribbon cutting at Michelle for um, their their newly uh, expanded Harahan office and new calibration lab. And it was so it was so rewarding, man, to walk through there and so like so many of, of their employees, their clients, dignitaries who were there were like, hey, man, we, l we listen to you every day. We, we love hearing you talk about Michelle. And uh, I'm thrilled, man. I love being able to represent that brand. It's a great local company. It's been around for 76 years, all 30 offices across 11 states, and they're based right here in Louisiana. I mean, think about that expansion over 76 years while maintaining their local ownership and their presence in Louisiana. So if you weigh or measure something, you need your pre precision measurement de uh, devices calibrated, go with a local company. Go with Michelle. Michelle Weighing and Measurement. Michelle.com. Michelle.com. Okay, y'all. It is after further review. Uh, been a really good show, man. If you missed anything, AFR On Demand presented by Brett Golf. You can catch it uh, however you get your podcast. Just search after further review. You know, you can always text me, uh, email me, tweet me, text me. Uh, always love interacting, so we appreciate y'all for being there whenever you can be. Let me knock out uh, my final break of the show. We'll come back. Otter will be here. We'll find out what we're betting on tonight. Don't you move. It's AFR. AFR.
AFR is brought to you by River City's One Hour Air, where they're always on time, or you don't pay a dime, 752-0001-752-0001, or online at onehourbr.com. Spell it out, O-N-E, onehourbr.com. I want to remind you, you know, we're getting into the warm weather months, and before you know it, the oppressive triple-digit temperatures are going to be here. Make sure you call River City's One Hour Air for the preseason AC tune-up. It's affordable. It's easy. What they're going to do is they'll send a technician to your house. They'll make sure your home central AC is clean and running efficiently. Because the last thing in you in the world you want is some little bitty problem that when your AC is running round the clock, 24-7, 365, when it's 110, your heat index of 110, that causes a really big problem. Catch it now. Call River City's One Hour Air, 752-0001, 752-0001, where they're always on time or you don't pay a dime. After further review, presented by Relief Windows, Windows Door Sighting. Oh, yeah, they also do interior shutters. Down the stretch, we come final segment here on a Monday edition of AFR, presented by Relief Windows. One thing left to do, we'll find out what we're betting on tonight. We'll visit with Jimmy Ott. Otter Locks, presented by Lofton Staffing Services. At Lofton, we put people to work. Call us today at 924-0200 or go to lofton.jobs. Uh, the Otter joins us back from the bow. Otter, how are you? Good, man. Uh, what a what a fun weekend, man. Fun. Always, always fun uh, down there for the uh, first weekend of uh, March Madness. But, uh, you know, it is a light schedule. I can't offer an opinion of any value to the two CBI games tonight. The, fir- the only Come four on, games, Otter! The only four games <laughs> the NBA with confirmed lineup are real garbage. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's just tough, and, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I can't tell you. It's, uh, we've got a few women's basketball games, but nothing nothing on this uh, tonight as well. But, you know, sort of recap on the weekend, Matt, um, you know, the public loves betting the underdog Cinderella story, the mid-majors in the first two days of the tournament. But the uh, the favorites uh, covered all four days, 9 and 7 Thursday, 9 and 7 Friday, Six and two on Saturday, and then five and three uh, last night. So the public did shift, though, uh, their action from the underdogs to the favorites mm. on Saturday and Sunday as then more the designer teams, the jitters are out the way, and well, they uh, they uh, they cashed in a lot. Only uh, you know uh, a one one big uh, underdog uh, winning outright yesterday, saving them from really getting hammered, and that was Clemson over Baylor. Um, anything you're looking ahead to already for the uh, the round of 16? Yeah, um, uh, we're just uh, looking at them, looking at uh, the the uh, uh, the Clemson line that is climbing a little bit. Uh, on uh, oh gosh, where, where, where we look at it today? The um, oh shoot, Matt. Uh, I'm Arizona. looking at Cle- Clemson, Arizona. I'm looking at seven right now. Well, the one thing is that UConn, since they lost. Uh, I mean, that line is climbed already. That line opened up against Northwestern uh, yesterday. I mean, like at 11 and a half, they bet it to 14 and a half immediately. Uh, right. You know, just, I mean, since they lost to Om- uh, in Omaha to Creighton, they're on the nine game winning streak and they've covered eight of those nine. Mm-hmm. And they're not coming close uh, either. I mean, Northwestern did get within range uh, late last night. But I mean, UConn is just, they are just pounding them like the games, uh, the games are over. And San Diego State's the only long representative for the Mountain West Conference that got beat up pretty good uh, in this tournament as well. So, you know, the, coming into this tournament, UConn was the public team. They're down to two to one to win mm. the whole thing. Wow. So, uh, I mean, to, by comparison, Charlie and I got, got plus 350 on any of the Big East teams uh, to win the, the whole thing. That includes Creighton and uh, Marquette. Uh, left standing as well. Alabama line has moved from four to four and a half, so they're betting North Carolina a little early. Um, the, the funny thing is, Alabama, you know, Oates talked about it after their first round game. One of their uh, players talked about it in a post game presser. They played hard on defense last night. Mm. They came 40 points under the total uh, last night. So, you know, this 
If they continue to play defense like that, they're going to be an under team all of a sudden. They're the highest scoring team in the country, you know, uh, over the course of the season. So, you know, like AM. One all minute of remaining. Saw, uh, started, started scoring, and they, they were a very fashionable pick on the overs as of late, including last night, yeah. which they went over, e- even in regulation by, you know, 30 or 40 points. Yeah, that was wild. I mean, to, to have the, the 100 to 95 final, even in an overtime game, was was wild right. to see in that, that uh, Houston Texas A&M game. Well, uh, the round of 16 is coming up uh, this weekend. We'll uh, hopefully have a, a better card tomorrow night around uh, the association. We'll have, uh, we'll have something on the docket. Maybe we can... Uh, you will have, we will have something tomorrow. We'll you holler at our boy Colucci. See if he can get us some, uh, <laughs> some hockey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Otter, where are you tomorrow? We're at Dozy Place on Government Street in Mid-City. Very good. Thank you, Otter. Have a great night. All right. Yeah. All right, the one and only Jimmy Otter. All right, that's going to do it for us here on uh, this Monday edition of AFR. We always appreciate Relief Windows and ReliefWindows.com. Y'all check them out. Muse, Polly, I appreciate it. Y'all have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow at 3. AFR.